Hi, welcome to Venture Scaler. I'm Sasha, three time head of people at Venture Back Startups. And I'm Jake, three times ops and growth leader from the Venture Back Startup circuit as well. And we're here dropping all of our best tips on how to scale your startup. Hello, welcome to the show, Jen. We're so excited to have you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me, Sasha. So excited. Yay! Of course, of course. For everyone out there who doesn't know you and think you're as fabulous as I do, why don't you share the TLDR version of your story and catch everybody up to speed? Yeah. Uh, so um, I feel like it's an oldie, but a goodie, but didn't go to school for HR, went to school for opera. Yep. I have a master's in opera um, and uh, fell into the recruiting side of the business and loved it so much fell in love with the candidate experience and getting candidates jobs, uh, wanted to see them succeed and, you know, be at the company with them. So tied in the HR side of it after that and fast forward, you know, 10 years and I'm at Privy. We are um, startup. Uh, I've grown them, doubled them in size in the last two years. So we're 70 people now, mostly based here in Boston, but kind of all over the New England area. And um, I head up all of kind of the HR, people, ops, recruiting, you name it. I, I kind of do a little bit of everything. So yeah, that's me. Nice. So tell us a little bit more about your experience at Privy. Uh, what are you primarily focused on these days? Yeah, so primarily focused on today uh, is very different than it was when I first started. So a lot of my day to day has one on one coaching sessions with managers now. So we're talking through um, how their team is doing uh, any kind of employee relations issues they have. Um, I do scatter in some awesome recruit recruiting phone screens still so I get to do the recruiting side but um, my employee experience manager actually does some of it too. We, we kind of share the load on that. And then um, overall, I am um, having some uh, more kind of business operations meetings um, with our managers, as well as putting together um, any, uh, any programs. Um, I, I am active um, executive sponsor on the DEI team. So I am working very closely with them and putting programming in place for that. Uh, and then I work really closely with our employee experience manager for our events, um, really anything, anything programming or policies related still kind of falls into my, my purview too. Nice. So you joined, it looks like you joined immediately after uh, Privy raised its series A, is that right? Correct. Yeah. I think the cash had just been, uh, you know, cashed when, uh, when I joined. So were you, yeah. were you the first, uh, like people ops hire? Yes. And it's my, like, that's my jam. I've done that like three times and it has been amazing and a challenge every single time. <laughs> Very cool. So I, I want to know, like when you walking into that situation, just closing the series A, you're the first people ops hire. What are like the first three projects you tackled uh, when you started at Privy? So I hired, I think like 10 people in the first quarter. Wow. I created a onboarding program. And then um, I also took a look at kind of their benefits and made sure that we had, um, you know, state good, good benefits for the entire company and that employees were really excited about. Um, so those are probably the three big, big buckets there. Um, the employee experience side, though, is something I, I tried to focus on, too. Very cool. Sasha, any follow up? Yeah, sorry. I was like just nodding along with everything you're saying, like, yes, yes, yes. Um, when you talk about onboarding, what did that mean? What all did that encompass for you in designing that for, for Privy? Yeah. So since I was the first people ops person, um, they didn't really have an onboarding program beforehand. It was the CEO went to the Apple store, bought you a Mac, and then you had a Mac on your desk. And that, that was my onboarding, um, like for, like when I first started. And so I, um, I, I kind of paired it after my own onboarding that I built out for myself, which was grabbing kind of different people in different departments and having them talk me through what does your department do at a high level? You know, walk me through, educate me on that. And then the other part that I wanted to make sure we did um, is I wanted everyone to know how to build the product or how to like, how to use the product in general. So um, I had everyone uh, and including myself um, 
download Privy and, and put it up on, and, and get some campaigns um, up there so that they could actually know the ins and outs of, you know, what does the product actually do? And then the other thing um, when we were first starting out that we did um, was I actually sat down with our support team. So our head of support and I had a, I shadowed her for an entire day. And that was really valuable from a customer um voice perspective and really getting the um, the knowledge I needed um, just to learn you know, who are we building this product for and why are we building it. Uh, so that's kind of the, the bare bones that it started out as. It has evolved so much since then, but that's kind of where it all started. Yes. I love it. When so outside of understanding what functional groups do and how you fit into that puzzle and um, and all of like the, the company org pieces, what did you do or what has the Privy team done to, sorry, I'm like distracting myself with my, um, <laughs> my phone. Okay. Um, what did you do to set up new hires for success? So they clearly understood the role that they were walking into and they knew how success was measured, like obviously early on in their first 30, 60, 90 days, but then like moving forward once they've acclimated to the business. Yeah. So I, uh, it was, it happened in the late part of my first year at Privy, uh, where we actually started working together um, to create these career ladders for each department. Um, I, I walked into Privy and we actually had engineering career ladders already established. Um, they paired it after um, the rent the runway uh, career ladders. And I loved that so much because it gave new hires an expectation of, okay, I'm at this level now. If I do X, Y, and Z, or if I work on X, Y, and Z, I can get to that next level. And so as, as I knew we were going to grow the team, you know, we doubled in size, we were going to need people that were going to go from a uh, individual contributor to a manager or even to a senior role. And we needed to have those expectations set pretty early on in, in Privy's kind of growth um, stage. So I worked one-on-one -on -one with managers um, to, to get those up and running. And then uh, we actually used those specific competencies in the career ladders for our performance reviews um, this, this go around in March or in January. That's amazing. I love that. I love the focus and like the balance on of employee experience and career pathing and finding the right next step for them while also managing expectations within their role and the competencies. Um, how was how was that methodology received by the team? Yeah, I mean, I think people were almost craving it at one point. You know, um, one thing that I, I I always kind of go back to is like people can never get enough feedback. Mm -hmm. You know, people really love hearing, you know, what they're doing and they love hearing what they're doing well, but I also think they crave how, how can I improve and what am I like, what do I need to do to actually get myself to a promotion or to that next level and, or to be recognized um, that I am doing a, you know, a great job at something. Um, so I think the overall, the career ladders went over very, very well. Um, it took a little bit of back and forth with managers um, to, to really get it right. And, and the calibration needed to be there. So mm -hmm. sometimes we, um, from a tactical perspective, sometimes we actually would talk about kind of the, the employees that were doing really well and were really successful and kind of use them as a North star. Um, and then other times the manager would leverage kind of their previous experience and kind of what, what would I, you know, think of as differentiating from like an, a, a, um, an ISR one to an ISR two mm -hmm. kind of thing. Do you, do you find either at Privy or other organizations that when you develop a career ladder, the employees feel misaligned with where they are classified within the ladder? Hmm. That's a good question. Yeah. I mean, I haven't, I haven't found that at Privy. I do think even going through our last round of performance reviews, I do think that um, some employees would rate themselves maybe higher than their manager would. And that's, that's a great conversation starter. It is a tricky conversation, but it is a, a great conversation starter to talk about expectations. And I do think that when a manager is actually hiring, one of the best things they can do is set the expectations right off the bat. You know, when a new hire is going through the interview process, thinking mm -hmm. about like, and, and leveraging and weaving that in from the get-go so that your expectations are set by day one. And then by day 30, you're like, okay, I am on track or, hey, I'm a little behind. Here's what I need to work on. Um, hopefully you're already, you've already had, you know, a 
weekly one-on-one -on -one with your manager to make sure you you're keeping on track. But, um, but yeah, I think that's, that's what, what I'd say on that. Love it. Yeah. From a, a tactical perspective, because I like to stay here and then go down to the weeds again. Um, what are, what are some tips for folks that are rolling this out that might uh, like might be rolling up career ladders for the first time and seeing quite a bit of that misalignment. What are some tips to help maybe prevent that in the next cycle and help set expectations properly over the next quarter or two? Yeah, I mean, I think that one one pitfall that happens, and and I'm hoping that this this is our very first time to formally do the reviews. So I think that this was almost inevitably going to happen anyway. Um, but one pitfall I think that that happened. Um, that could be avoided next time is if a person thinks that they're ready for a promotion, but their manager does not think they're ready for a promotion. And how can, how can they have that conversation? Um, a good thing that I have seen at least a few managers do is a midpoint check-in mm -hmm. on that. Uh, and this is actually really good for employees that have been with Privy for like seven, eight months where they have that midpoint check-in and they are um, not only seeing kind of their performance, but also anonymized team performance too, so that they understand where they kind of sit within the team as well. Nice. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. That, that was fabulous. Thank you. Um, how many, so Privy has 70 employees right now, right? Yes, we just hit 70 on Monday. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> Congratulations, that's so exciting. Um, so what systems are you currently using to manage this performance and career ladder process right now? Well, I'm glad you asked. Uh, so we, yeah, uh, so we uh, use 15.5, which uh, we basically, every employee on Friday gets a note uh, to fill in their check-in for the week. And then um, this check-in basically has, um, how is the employee feeling from a 1.5 scale? And then it has a few additional questions. So the employee can put in what are the wins uh, that they had for the week? So like, I really love this um, project that I was working on, it's on time, you know, whatever that you wanna put in, you could put in a challenge of, hey, I need help with X, Y, and Z. Can you, you know, talk to this person or, or help me on this? Like, can we spend some time? Uh, and then there's usually one company question in there as well. So one of the last ones we did um, was, what would hinder you from taking time off? Um, it's been a huge, like, taking time off during a pandemic, I could talk about this for like hours and hours of how important it is. And like, also like beat myself up about it because I forget to do this sometimes too, like physician heal thyself. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, but that, uh, but the, the check-in that we get is so valuable from a managerial perspective, but also from a people operations perspective as well. So um, we've been using 15.5 weekly for that. And then we did the performance reviews in there and they are competency-based, uh, like mostly competency-based, uh, but we do throw in two open-ended questions at the very beginning. And the first open-ended question is a reflection back. You know, what are the strengths that I had that I love over the last six months. And then the other question is actually forward looking, which is what are the strengths or what are the things that I want to improve upon in the next six months? And I really think um, by putting in the six months, you give yourself a firm goal. It's not mm -hmm. crazy. Like, it's not like, what do you want to do in five years? It's what do you want to accomplish or get to do, like do better in in six months, do better in, sorry, I cannot talk about it today all too. And I, I got more sleep than you did. So, um, but it, it, it all, it all comes back to, you can't just have a performance review be backward looking. You have to have it be forward looking too. And that bleeds into the competencies where no one was a five out of five on the competencies, you know, like everybody has some kind of room for growth and that's what that's what should be happening. You should be having those growth conversations about, hey, you're doing really well at, um, you know, telling a customer story or story, like storytelling for the customer. And that's helping you with negotiation. And, uh, but you could be doing better. And these are, these are the reasons you could be doing better and how you could do it. So. I love that. With, with all of that, and the career paths within your role, is there any opportunity for lateral movement or moving between departments and like taking like a little sidestep in your career? 
Yeah, I, I think it depends on the employee and what they want to do. Um, we've had a, a, a little bit of lateral movement. So we've mm -hmm. had a member of our technical escalations team move over to the engineering side. Um, we've had a member of our product marketing team move over to the product team as well. Um, and then we have had a lot of internal growth. Uh, as well. Uh, but it really, it really depends on the individual and, and balancing, I think, the individual's needs, but also the business operations needs too. For sure. Okay. Yeah. But there are a lot of transferable competencies in mm -hmm. there. Um, when putting together the performance reviews, I created this competency bank. So, in, in, so the managers could actually pick from that bank, you know, what were maybe the top, you know, f like really five to nine, because that's all 15, five, what you do. But um, what are the top competences they wanted to focus on during their performance review for that employee? But there's so many competencies that could have been on the sales side that could have been on a marketing team's competencies too. How often is a manager like going back and having conversations with their employee about that feedback? Is it like a set cadence? Is it monthly, quarterly, annually? It depends on the manager. Uh, so I have managers that will actually do one of their review, uh, one of their um, one-on-ones each month will be to talk about career conversations. Nice. And then I have other managers that they, they do check-ins every single week, but they will not, um, they don't have a set day for it. It's usually if the employee wants to talk more about it. Um, typically it'll happen within that team. Um, if the employee is having any, uh, any performance issues, or if they're like maybe falling a little behind. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it depends on the manager actually on that one. I haven't, I haven't dictated it down of like, Hey, this is the week that everybody's going to talk about it. So yeah. Don't I think I it down, but, yeah. Philosophical follow-up question. Mm -hmm. Whose responsibility do you think it is to manage the career path? Is it the employee to like own their journey and figure out what they want to be doing and advocating for themselves? Or is it the leader making sure that, I don't want to lead the question, I don't have an answer. Is it the leader owning that process? Oh, I can't, I, I'm good. You're going to hate my answer. I think it's both. <laughs> um, because so the employee, the employee needs to kind of understand, you know, what they like doing and express you know, hey, I have an interest in X, but then the manager, they have a great unique perspective where they can see, you know, what are the skills that an employee is doing really well? And can you, you know, can you guide them in that direction too? Um, so I, I think it has to be, you know, a, a partnership there on the growth. I don't think it can be just driven by, by one or the other. Um, I do think that if a manager is noticing that an employee is kind of either wavering on their, you know, what they want to do or something that a manager can proactively start asking questions mm -hmm. on that and, and help in that way. Um, but yeah, I think it has to be both. Love it. That's fine. <laughs> Any answer works. <laughs> oh, okay, good. But I was a little scared there for a minute. I don't know. Like, huh. yeah. Do you have a, a general performance philosophy and how you think about managing adults at work and ensuring that they feel um, successful and like they have a path, but while also managing business performance? So I, I'll break it down a few different ways. So I think the recognition piece of it is really important too. And just to understand how employees like to be recognized. Um, I think that, well, I don't think there's research out there because I put it in my performance review, like um, overview of the entire company being like recognition equals productivity. And there's lots of research out there for um, having recognition um, make more productive teams. So I think that you, you have to start there and understand how does an individual want to be recognized um, and also maybe change it up a little bit too. And have it a few different ways because if you haven't ever gotten a public shout out, maybe you don't know you like that at all. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it really depends on that side of it. And then I do think that nudging the employees sometimes and, and giving them kind of a safe space to be like, hey, I need more feedback or like, hey, can you go into detail on what you mean by this? Um, I think that um, that comes into play when the manager and the employee have such a trusting, you know, trusting relationship. 
Yeah. I, I love the, the foundation of building trust and giving thanks for all the work that they're doing. I think that's such an easy, like, it sounds bad. Like it's such an easy win. Like just thank them for what they're doing. It's like, even if it wasn't the right thing, like you did work, like, thank you for doing work. <laughs> it means a lot. Thanks for spending your day with us. And then if there, if improvements are, are needed, then providing feedback in real time and being constructive and kind. Um, yeah. But I feel like that's such an easy free way, uh, like you said, like to help build productivity. And I think so often it's overlooked. It, it really is. And um, I, no one has ever said no to positive feedback. Like, oh, I've had too much <laughs> positive feedback. I'm sorry. Like you just need to like back it up here. Like no one's ever told me that. And I personally like, bring on that feedback, right? Like I, whenever an employee actually is like, thank you so much for connecting me to our broker. I'm like, you're welcome. <laughs> like it just, like you said, thank you. Yay. Like it's the freak in me comes out. And I'm like, yes, they appreciate me. I would, I don't know if anybody's going to ever see my facial expressions on this. I'm very like making weird, evil, like fairy tale faces at the moment. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, like, I mean, it's, it all, it comes down to the recognition side and employees want to feel valued. And how do you, how do you show them that they're being valued? You know, you're not, you're not offering them free beer. You know, you're, you're saying, thank you. You know, the work you do here is really important. It adds to, you know, X, Y, and Z. I appreciate you, that kind of stuff. So soapbox off. So let's talk compensation. Uh, you talked about like your career ladders. I'm sure there's a compensation component to all that and performance, right? So what actionable steps have you taken to ensure that pay philosophies and strategies that you've built are, are fair and competitive? Yeah. So there's a few different tools out there that um, help kind of get the product, um, the mark, like the market and, and kind of understand what is out there in the marketplace. So I've, um, I've been a big fan of the free pay scale recently, uh, cause you know, startup world can't really pay for a massive Radford thing. Um, there is another one called option impact that I've been looking into a little bit more and, and thinking through because I think that would be good too. Um, with a lot of our established career ladders, so on our sales side, on our customer um, success and our customer support and our onboarding team, all the levels are completely prescripted. So like if you are a um, ISR, you have one particular compensation. Once you move up to a senior ISR, you have a different compensation, but it's all of them are completely equal. Um, and I think that, that that equity takes like takes into account like, like making making sure that it is equitable for every single person in that um, factor um, takes a lot of the guesswork out for sure. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, like I would theoretically know if someone's at the same level as me or the level higher, like the rung up the ladder, kind of have an idea of what they're they're making because we're all at the same levels. Is that right? Yeah, you'd have pretty you'd have a good idea of it. We we haven't gone so far to publish. Um, so we have all of our career ladders published, but we haven't gone so far to publicly, you know, publish like this is what this one is and this one and this one. But um, employees, I would say, have a sense of what they are. Sure. Yeah. Um, and you said the majority of your team's located in Boston, correct? Mm -hmm. yeah. So how does that and maybe this has already come up and you figured this out or maybe like, you know, expanding the team geographically really isn't on the roadmap. So you don't need to cross that bridge, but how does that, that strategy translate to uh, like, if, if someone's in a different city other than Boston? Yeah. So right now we've been paying market rates for like, we, we have employees that move to New Hampshire, Vermont, um, New Jersey. Um, we have one employee in New York and that's the only one. Um, and that's that like when, when we move to cities that are um, potentially a higher price point, I still haven't exactly figured out what I want to like, how I want to handle that right now. But we haven't, we haven't had a philosophy where we're going to lower anybody's salary to, to that market rate. So sure. yeah. yeah. I know that you aren't, you've shared the comp or the career ladders, but haven't shared comp bands. Mm -hmm. Why? haven't you shared the comp bands? 
And like full transparency, like I also haven't shared our comp bands and it's been like a, a big discussion for my team internally is like, should we, or should we not? What are the pros and cons? I'm curious, like what went into your thought process around keeping those um, private? Yeah. So I feel like I'm gonna have another soapbox moment. Um, so the, the hard thing I think for folks when they're first getting into their, to, to their career even to know that a person that has less experience than me but is doing a different job is going to make more money than me. And I think that is really challenging for them to see. Um, I know it was for me when I got into recruiting. I mean, I was hiring you know, software engineers and I was making like half of what they made and they were just getting out of school. And I was like, ah, uh. so like, I, I get it, right? Like it's an adjustment. So I think that that would be very challenging to, uh, to educate employees on And then maybe that's a cop out too. I mean, maybe we should, I mean, there, I, I know there's a few startups that have done that, but I, I, and I should ask them like how they get over that hump, because that's one of my biggest fears, especially also with any teams like I would say we have a pretty good um, just median uh, salary for, for folks anyway. Um, but it's, I think it's still a little challenging because of where some roles fit within the market versus other roles. And I could see it being perceived as very unfair. I wish I could change that market and, and just, you know, shake it all up. That'd be kind of cool. <laughs> no, I, I think that's super fair. Um, I've, I've, worked in places that we ended up disclosing comp bans and it was a disaster. Um, that's a little bit hyperbolic. It wasn't a disaster. Um, but for the, but for the folks who felt like they were underpaid or felt like they, they disagreed with where they were slotted within the career bands, um, it was really challenging. And it went from a discussion for two times a year to like, almost like every week. It's like, why is this not like why I don't understand this. And it was such a hassle for the leaders on those teams. Mm -hmm. And it felt like instead of empowering our employees and being transparent, it was creating so much chaos and frustration and animosity rather than like this was supposed to like help everyone feel together as we like kumbaya over transparency. And that was not the end result. It was very upsetting. Yeah, that is my, that is a fear of mine. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. But also I could have done it horribly and it could have been on me. And I'm sure that these other companies like, like Buffer, I know is one of the ones that's publicized everything. And I think that's very brave. Um, and also leaves a very little margin for error, mm -hmm. um, True. which as a practitioner is a little frightening. Same. Yeah. <laughs> I shouldn't be holding my breath over here, right? Like I'm not anxious. It's fine. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. All right. So switching gears a little bit. Um, I'm really interested in, uh, you were people operations person number one at this startup right after series A, you made the comment that that's what you do. You've done that like two, three times before. So I, I love that experience. What's, what's a piece of advice that you would give to somebody in that situation? They're, they're employee number one on the people ops team uh, that, that's looking to, you know, build a team and scale a culture at a, at a, growing startup? I, um, I think it's funny, but it's have a plan, but be ready to throw it out immediately. Um, so I, I always come in um, with like things that I think like the CEO and I have talked about, or like the founder and I have talked about, I'm like, okay, these are all things I want to do. And then I get in and the first two weeks are usually like ingestion mode, right? Like I'm having a lot of one-on-ones with employees. I'm figuring out kind of where the gaps are. What do they need? What do they like, what do they see as far as kind of skills on the team that are missing or policies like programs, whatever, whatever they're looking at. So I am assessing so much that I, the, the plan I might've had like is read everywhere afterwards, right? Like there's, there's no, there's no line that is exactly the same afterwards. And uh, it's happened three times now where I've come in and been like, okay, I'm going to do all these things. And then I'm like, oh, not doing this yet. This is not happening. Or, oh, I want to do this instead. Like the priorities just start shifting everywhere. And, um, and even when you're, you know, even when you're having your, you know, final round interview with the CEO and, and maybe members of the exec team, and you're like, you're forming all these things, like you get in and they're like, Hey, we have all these other things that we didn't tell you about. Can you help us with this? 
like in like a sheepish way of like, I know we sold you on some things, but like, could you do this too? I don't know if you've been in that situation before, but I, I have been there and um, I'm like, okay, like let's solve that cool problem first and then we'll go to this, <laughs> right? Um, Cause that's why you get into this wacky world of startups in the first place. Like you're not here to just, you know, go from step A to step B, you know? So. Mm -hmm. I think that's some of the most valuable advice to give anyone in, in the people role or in a startup, early stage startup role in general. Like just be comfortable throwing out all of your work. Maybe you finish it and then they're like, ah, I don't want to do this anymore. And I know folks that take it super personally and it like stays with them. Like, well, remember that time that that thing that we did didn't end up getting like moved to production. It's like, yeah, I did. And it's okay. Like that's how, like the nature of the beast and I don't have to get used to it. Yeah, I was, uh, so I have a manager round table with our, uh, our like mid-level managers every month. And one of the things we talked about today was um, kind of assessing people's adaptability range mm -hmm. uh, before we hire them and really giving them like a, realist, a realistic preview into what that's going to be. Uh, because it's, you're, you're stepping into chaos no matter what, no matter even if you're a, a relatively established startup, there are going to be things that are going to change. And I feel like I need to write like um, an article. I'm like, pivot, like pivot here, pivot there. Like there's a pivot everywhere or something. I don't know. It's just, cause it's just, that's the world that we live in. And like, that's innovation. Like mm -hmm. if you're not doing that, then what are you doing? You know, it's <laughs> <laughs> very fair. Um, outside of the the lack of adaptability or inflexibility, what's the biggest mistake you see early stage people ops leaders make? Oh, um, well, I think they first solve problems that they think need to be solved, but maybe don't need to be solved immediately. Um, and I kind of alluded to that one already of have a plan and then be ready to move it out the window. Mm -hmm. um, I think the other thing is they don't spend enough time building trust with their CEO um, or their or their founder. I think that it has to be, it has to be this like really tight partnership. You have to be in lockstep to really make the company like to craft this company culture and build the things that you really need to build. I mean, you need their buy-in, but you also mm -hmm. you need like the the most refreshing one-on-one -on -one I've had with Ben, our CEO, is basically like oh, like, I trust you, like, go do whatever you, like, go do the thing. Like, there's no, that, that's like, really? Uh, okay, cool. Like, I, like, I had all, like, you know, I have PTSD from, uh, like, um, previous, where I'm, like, I came in with, like, my business agreements, and, like, here's all the business things, and the requirements, and ROIs, and all of these things, and I was, like, okay, go do it. Okay, cool. Okay, bye. <laughs> Peace, like, and run out. Like, it's, so I think the, you have to, you have to really spend that time building up that trust and, and earning that trust. You, you can't just come in and just think it's going to be there or, I mean, yeah. So. No, I love that. And I, I think so often this is overlooked and I've noticed that a lot of early stage startups, maybe because of lack of funds, end up hiring someone more junior into the people function, especially earlier on. Um, and I was talking to someone in my network the other day and she's like, I'm having such a hard time building trust with my hiring managers. Like I want to help them, but I, I need them to see me as credible. And I don't know, it was like this chicken and an egg. Like they don't trust me to do things, but I can't build trust without doing things and proving my value. So what feedback would you have for more junior folks in the function who need to build that trust, but maybe are like in that kind of hamster wheel of trying to, to help them? Ask more questions. Uh, like listen way more. Um, I, I think that when I'm talking with a new hiring manager, if I'm talking too much or being like, I know exactly what you need, like this and this and this, I've already gone wrong, right? Like I think, talk to me about your pain points and then I just shut mm -hmm. up, you know, like I just, I let them talk. And I think that once you, once you're starting to kind of hear them, you'll pull out specific nuggets and mm -hmm. you can then, you know, reiterate those back to them. Like, hey, I'm hearing X, Y, and Z. Does that make sense to you? Or, hey, is that what you mean? And that actually already clicks something. Nice. So I think asking as many questions as you can um, while also shutting up. <laughs> Love that. Uh, speaking of 
pain points. Mm -hmm. So what are the people related things that are keeping you up at night? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Mic drop right there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, what what doesn't keep me up at night? No. Um, so I we're in a global pandemic, as people know. Uh, burnout, mm -hmm. I feel like, has been the scariest thing for me to try and help to mitigate. Um, mm. Scary because there's not one way to do it. Every employee is different. And not everybody's going to be vocal about it. Yeah. And it bleeds into so many other things. It bleeds into mental health. It bleeds into, you know, maybe that trust with the manager. It bleeds into performance, like production, like it, mm -hmm. everything. It's like this disease that just creeps into every facet of a business and a person's life. So I, I think that, that that is scary and keeps me up at night. And it's not only just the employees burn out, but it's also me recognizing, okay, am I burnt out? Like, oh, okay, I need, I need to take a step back and like self-care here for a sec. Uh, and so I think that's, that's my scariness. I think that's a good one. <laughs> yeah, my monster in my closet. Like, <laughs> this is something that we've been talking a lot about internally because it's, it's a struggle to balance being at an early stage, high growth company where everything's on fire. I mean, I won't speak for everyone, but like there's burning priorities. Things need to get done. Like we're trying to do like X, Y, Z yesterday. Um, and it's really hard because folks want to have a work-life balance. And I know that looks different to everyone, but it, it is really hard to balance with expectations. We're like, we're not a huge company. We can't have a, a really casual nine to five all of the time. So how do you manage that? with uh, while keeping mental health as a priority. Yeah. Um, so there are always, I think the expectation is there's always going to be, you know, days when you're going to work, not a nine to five and that's fine. But I think you have to advocate for yourself and being like, Hey, I just, you know, spent like, I worked until like nine this other night. I'm gonna, you know, go on a walk at two and I'll see you tomorrow kind of thing. Mm -hmm. I think there has to be some kind of balance there. Um, I also do think, um, I don't know if this is an unfavorable, an unfavorable opinion, but I, I do think that really looking at the business needs and seeing how, how urgent is urgent, mm -hmm. you know, and what's driving that urgency. And then is there any way to like, is there any way to make it more efficient where people are not spending as much time on something, mm -hmm. but we're, we're still working. Totally. You know, like I, that, that's something that I've done a better job of, I think in my career now than I used to do where like, I can work more efficiently and get way more done than I could before because mm -hmm. I just know some of the shortcuts or like wait, like ways that I can do it quicker. Yeah. Totally. I love the efficiency play. Um, I've noticed, sorry to harp on this, but this is like literally been the last week of my life. Uh, I've noticed that junior employees or folks earlier in their career are less likely to advocate for themselves and are more likely to say yes, 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 and take on more work to show that they are excited about being here and can prove themselves as folks that should move up the career ladder. Mm -hmm. So how have you balanced that? Because we've had direct conversations with folks like stop working. This is not important enough for you not to sleep tonight. And sometimes that like they hear it and they're like, okay. And then they'll keep doing it because they want to continue to prove that they can do it. Yeah. Um, that's when the manager and I have a conversation and like, what do we need to do to build in something like to build in space? Um, one team uh, and, and the manager and I had talked about this um, last, like when the pandemic first hit, I was like, okay, I know your team is not going to take a lot of time off. It's just kind of who your, who your team is. What if we rotate every week, somebody has to take it, like has to take a week off. And it's just known that like, they're going to be off. They got coverage, like another person's getting off and it just rotated through the entire team. So that's more prescriptive, but it worked for that team. Mm -hmm. Now, if I tried it on a different team, it might not work, but it worked for that one. Um, and then I also think like, take a look at your policies. Like, so we, um, we actually just recently rolled out a vacation quota relief for our sales team 
because a lot of feedback we were getting from the sales team is they feel like they can't take time off because they're not going to hit their quota. And it's Mm -hmm. like, we are a business. Yes. But we also know that as a business, if we do not have, uh, if we have a burnt out sales team, they're never going to hit their numbers, you know, or they might hit it for the first month and then, you know, then it's going to just, you know, go downhill from there. So what are some policies that you can create to create, you know, space or framework, especially for the more junior folks to, mm-hmm. to have them almost, almost prescribe it though. Yeah. Yeah. So what I want to like look at your team, how, how big is your, the people ops team at Privy right now? We are a mighty team of two. So I have myself and an amazing employee experience manager that I could not live without. <laughs> That's so. so great. So I guess like looking at that, I'm sure there's like a ton on your plate. What are, what are one to two things that you wish that you could do, but there just aren't enough hours in the day? So many things. <laughs> uh, I, so I really... I really enjoy the one-on-one conversations that I have with managers. I I think that it has been, um, it's been really beneficial from a business as a whole to get like a, a full view of how everything is going. And I think I wish I could do more of those, um, with, with all the, all the managers for sure. But, um, even sometimes with employees, I think since we are just, remote and so siloed away from each other I'm not having these like five minute quick conversations anymore I miss I mean I I like miss those in my soul you know like I have um one employee that will say good morning Jen as soon as I walk in and I'm I miss that um it it just makes me very very sad they they recorded them saying it for me so I could watch my time now and it, it, it makes me so happy but like other than like but it's still it's one of those things that if there was more hours in the day, I'd probably just want to talk to more people. But I also know that it's not just, it's not just the hours in the day. It's also, I, I don't know how much more Zoom I can take. You know, sometimes it's just really challenging too. Some, and so I have, I have a lot of like, I'm trying to do more walking one-on-ones because it's nice and weather and yay. Um, but also I'm just like trying to change it up and having phone conversations as well as Zoom conversations too. What are some things that you wish you could take off your team's plate? Like that would give you that time back to like, to, to do those things. Mm. Um, that's tough. I, I, I think that the things that take my team the longest are more of the um, administrative kind of things. Mm-hmm. And those are the things that both of us, we do them, but we also kind of hate them. Um, so, I mean, I, for, for at least a month or two, I've been living in spreadsheets, like mm-hmm. lots and lots of spreadsheets. And um, being detail oriented is not a skill of mine. I have to like actively work at it every day. And so to, um, to be in spreadsheets and have to like make sure every single thing is correct, just like daunting is not even like the strong enough word to use for that. So I think like if there were any, anything that I'd want to like, this is going to sound bad. Anything I'd want to schluff off on someone else that like I could, I think it would be any kind of admin, uh, like administrative tasky things. What are some examples? Uh, (laughs) um, So the, this is where it's weird because it's like, it's kind of, it, have you ever done like a chart where it's like, you have, um, things that you have to do, like it has to be done by you. It can't be really done by other people and like things that probably could be done by other people. And then like the, um, the vertical is like, it's urgent versus it's not urgent. So everything keeps fitting into the quadrant where it's urgent and it has to be done by me. So for instance, we just went through our performance reviews, uh, which was really fun. Um, and I have to do all the promotions and everything. And so like I am taking, uh, so what, what we did for that, um, cause we didn't go into this detail was I gave managers a big pool of money and I said, here's your pool of money. Feel free to split it up however you'd like to, um, within, you know, within your team, within your career ladders and everything. And, um, and that was great, but now I have to go in and be like, this person got this much, this person gets this much, this, this, this. And if, I'm sure if I had like a payroll person, I could probably have them, like they would be 
fine to do it, but for right now, it kind of falls on me. So that's the, mm -hmm. the weird admin thing. Yeah. 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 Sure. Yeah. I know early on in our conversation, you mentioned you were the executive sponsor for your DEI committee or council. I'm not sure exactly what you said. Yeah. But I'm I'm curious what programs or initiatives that you have um, you've owned around the DEI space to ensure that you're building a, a diverse and inclusive workplace. Yeah. So there is kind of the recruiting side of it, which I'll talk about in a minute. But I I, I love talking about kind of the internal um, inclusivity and education mm -hmm. piece of it. Um, so for the month of Black History, um, we actually every single Friday we have an all company um, you know get like. It's, it's Friday at 11 and it, everybody gets up and talks a little bit about what their team is working on. And so the DEI team actually highlighted um, a specific black leader that they wanted to, um, so they wanted to highlight. So that was really, really great from a programming perspective. Uh, in the same month, we actually had a fireside chat with one of our merchants that is a, a merchant of color. And that was really awesome um, to just hear his story. And so I actually facilitated that conversation with, with the merchant. Um, and then and we also did a, um, a uh, oh my gosh, I'm like, a, 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 uh, it was an interview training where you're trying to like recognize your biases um, in that month too. So we've done, um, we've done some programming like that. We're, we're continuing on into um, highlighting uh, female leaders and talking about International Women's Day this, uh, this month. Um, still trying to get a fireside chat together. I am partnering with our customer success team to see what merchant they could um, they could share with us on that. And then we're actually doing um, a discussion on allyship uh, tomorrow. Mm -hmm. um, we one thing in the DEI team that I was um, well, an executive sponsor should be or should feel like they can be open and be vulnerable with the team. And one thing I I was talking about in the, one of the meetings was. I'm looking at all of us and all but one of us, and we actually, one of our members was missing. And I was like, all of us are female in this room. Where's our male allyship here? This is, if we're actually thinking about inclusion and belonging and, and being diverse, like we have to make sure that our, our DEI core team is diverse too. And so, um, this last week when our male member came back, he, he, um, he was like, oh, that makes total sense. I didn't even notice this. Um, but, and so like allyship is really important to talk about. And so that's one thing um, that led to a, an, an open discussion tomorrow on, on that too. So I'm hoping to have more programming um, like that moving forward. But um, I think that leading with education and leading with um, understanding and, and, you know, just having open talks has been really great. So, yeah. Nice. And then you mentioned something about the uh, the hiring side of things, recruiting. Yeah. Yeah, so on the recruiting side, um, the the DEI team actually did uh, more research uh, first. Um, so when they were, were first um, kind of getting to the recruiting side, um, they sent over a lot of actual um, job boards that uh, I hadn't even heard of, um, and. Uh, and a few actually rec recruiting firms that were um, targeting um, underrepresented groups. Nice. Uh, and so that was really great because they're kind of an extension of the recruiting side for me. Uh, and then one thing that um, I wanted to make sure that um, from an executive you know, sponsorship program, I was like, I want to make sure the company is fully invested in this. So what can we do from a, a leadership level? And one thing that the, the DEI team and I talked about was availability and making sure that our roles are actually available and accessible to underrepresented groups and people of color. And so we, um, one of my kind of scorecard goals for the year is to have every, um, every role that we open up have at least 30% of the applicants be um, a, a person of color. Like, right. So um, that's been great to just keep ourselves, um, you know, you know, on, on track with that. And the thought process is that if we have more applicants at the top of the funnel, that just means that everything, and we're following kind of the competency-based interview model, inevitably we will have people uh, at the, at the, you know, offer an interview stage too. So, yeah. As you've, as you've modeled this over the last couple of months or years mm -hmm. and building a more diverse pipeline, have you seen that translate to more diverse hiring? Yes, actually, it's still slow. Um, it's still a slow moving process. Um, so we have noticed it. I think the first thing that we did was just 
what, like who, who applies to Privy? You know, like what is the candidate profile that applies to Privy in the first place? And, uh, and so the applicant tracking system that we use, Greenhouse has a few reports that you can pull and not a perfect data set, sadly enough. So it, it, I don't get as perfect of data as I would love, um, but it does give you a view into, you know, what, um, you know, what are the applicants um, that, that are applying to Privy? And mm -hmm. you can start to see trends right then and there. And you're like, oh, okay, is it? And then, then you actually start to look at your network and you're like, okay, my network, who's in my network? Do I actually have, do I have people of color in my network? Do I have people of underrepresented groups in my network? Like, have I expanded my network out enough? Mm -hmm. And I think there's no enough at this point. Mm -hmm. um, and then that's, that bubbled up to our senior leadership team too, being like, what do your networks look like? How can we do like, how can we expand out our networks? Like my, my CEO, Ben is a big champion of that too. Love it. Those are all of my questions. Jake, do you have any burning questions? Nope, nothing no. burning. <laughs> <laughs> nothing else burning in there. No. Okay, cool. Well, that's upsetting. Actually, no, I do have one. I lied. I'm sorry. Oh, you big liar. <gasps> sorry. It's I'm too tired. I, I'll have you know, I want to be sponsored by Bing because I have an unhealthy obsession. Oh, that's a lot. <laughs> it's real, it's real bad, but it's delicious. Like it's so necessary for my health. Anyway, um, what are your plans, if any, to scale up your people team? And how do you plan on structuring that as Privy continues to scale? Mm. So I've been thinking about this for a while and trying to figure out, um, I, the way I like to scale a people ops team depends on what the business needs. And so for Privy, I foresee us potentially hiring more people. So I might actually hire a recruiter as the next um, person on the team, but it really goes back to that crazy chart that I mentioned where it's mm -hmm. like, what, what are things that I can take off my plate that are urgent, not urgent, and me, not me. Mm -hmm. um, it's, that that's the other challenge I think as when you were talking about a people leader getting into a startup um, I know I'm going off on a tangent and I apologize but um, when and when like when to delegate and when not to delegate that is a very um, you know, just strike a balance with that one but like mm -hmm. I I love giving my Legos away like I would give all my Legos away to do other like do even more things and different things you know like I'm, I'm a big fan um, but I think I'd probably, I think I'd probably hire a recruiter next. It also depends because my, um, my employee experience manager really loves to do it all. And she does a great job at like really putting her hand in everything. So I would want to have a conversation with her, I think as well. And just think about, you know, what, are there any other areas where she really wants to lean in more? Oh. As a pro? Mm -hmm. Nice. Yeah. yeah. I love it. Well, this was perfect. Thank you so much for oh. hanging out with us for an hour, Jen. You were a delight. I feel like I learned so many things. I'm like frantically scribbling notes. Like I have to implement all of this at Trainual. This is amazing. So thank you so much. We appreciate thank you. you. This oh. was fantastic. Well, thank you both for having me on. I'm just honored to get to chat with you. So yay. <laughs> Hey you, thanks for listening to Venture Scaler. If you liked what you heard, please be sure to give us a thumbs up and hit the subscribe button below so you never miss an episode. The show is also available on all podcast platforms so you can find it anywhere you wanna listen. And if you found the information helpful, share it with a friend, family member, or anyone else that you think could benefit. You're also welcome to connect with us on LinkedIn. I'm Sasha Robinson, and it's Jake Huber. Thanks again for watching, and we'll see you next time.